you say amen or am I afraid? Uh, if, you, if you agree with, with, with what is being said and what is uh, what we share with you. Uh, can I pray as we uh, encourage one another for these uh, for these few moments? Father, thank you. Thank you for our time of sharing together and God we are grateful. We worship you. We uh, recognize you as King, as Lord, as Savior and I just Thank you for these men who are here, God. Bless their families, their extended families. What you put their hands to, oh God, we pray that it prospers and that it will uh, fulfill the very purpose that you called them to. Thank you, God, for uh, this establishment and the leadership and uh, just um, allowing us this time of fellowship. We pray your blessings in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 There's a passage, a few verses in Colossians 3 that um, I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, are familiar with. And I want to just read it and then try to uh, say a few words of encouragement um, from this very passage. Colossians 3, as um, Apostle Paul is talking to the church at Colossians, and, and I just believe that it's... Uh, saying something for us as men today. And I uh, just want to emphasize today a, uh, a man and his legacy, a man and his legacy. What, what, what we are doing now, how we will affect or impact uh, when we are long gone, the people that we love and the people that are closest to us. So um, a few verses from Colossians 3, starting at verse 14. And it says this, but above all things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body. And then he says, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Verse 17 says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father of him. Verse 23 says, And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Amen. So that I don't uh, go over my allotted time, Doug, I won't, I will stop reading there, but I'll cover uh, some of the other verses that are that are there what's legacy what's what's legacy legacy is something that has been achieved that continues to exist long after the person is gone or long after the person dies there's a great biblical um, legacy that is recorded and left by Joshua I love Joshua of course mentored by Moses and in Joshua 24 and 15, Joshua let it be known. He says, as for me and my house. Anybody know that verse? Yeah. We will serve the Lord. <laughs> Joshua let it be known that I can't control your family. I can't control your household and the decisions that you make. But as for me and my house, the legacy that I want to live is that we will serve the Lord. If you go to uh, most correctional facilities and you ask the question, how many men in the correctional facility has a positive relationship with their father? Few hands go up. And this is a <coughs> reminder of the importance of the father or a positive uh, mentor, male mentor in the men, in the lives of men. And we certainly can't ignore that. So Colossians is written not just to men, but to everyone and to believers and with the expectation that um, the people of God will apply what they hear and what they know and then enjoy the benefits and the blessings of that. And so when we look at these few verses, there's the importance of character that shows up. And we know character as uh, who we are when nobody is looking, or at least when we think nobody is looking. <laughs> because usually somebody is looking all the time, even when we think no one is looking. 
but character is, is important. And so they were to remain um, in this, in a lifestyle that pleases God and uh, remove themselves from immoral living. What's good about God, he, he, he doesn't do it one-sided. He doesn't just say, um, stay away from this. There's always, here's what you can enjoy. You remember back in, in, in uh, with Adam and Eve, he says, you know, stay away from this, but you can enjoy all of this. Mm -hmm. Just stay away from this. And um, God has offered us so much, um, but sometimes we like to hang out in the places where he says to stay away from. And so he's trying to help the church. He's trying to help us as men to be godly men, to be uh, men of character, men of integrity, um, be unified in our walk towards uh, the toward uh, living a life that bring, brings glory to God the Father. And so they're reminded uh, to put off uh, living that displeases God and to put on godly living. And then verse 14, he says, above all of this, he says, put on love. And love is the bond of perfection or the bond of unity. He says, above all of this, put on love. And by the way, love is not wimpy or weak. Love is powerful because it was love that sent Jesus Christ to the cross. Can I get an amen? Amen. 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 It was love that sent him to the grave and it was love that raised him for the sins of the world. And so love sh shares in uh, 1 Corinthians 13. Anybody went to a wedding lately? You may have heard these yes. few verses, 1 Corinthians 13, uh -huh. but I'm going to read it among strong, godly Amen. men. Uh, Amen. Right. Yeah. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8 says, Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Now abide faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is what? The. Love. Love is not wimpy, nor is it weak. Love is powerful. In fact, the Amen. scripture declares that love covers a multitude of sins. Amen. And we are grateful Amen. for that. A husband and wife, they were having uh, some <coughs> issues. They were arguing with each other. And I know none of the men here know anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> they were arguing. And so the wife suggested that they both write their complaints on a piece of paper and then they would exchange them. So they agreed. They got the paper, got the pen, and they were both angry, and they began to write their complaint about their spouse. They would look at each other and think, and then they would begin to write more. <laughs> the wife finished hers, and she put her pen and pencil down, but the husband, he was still writing his complaint. <laughs> he got to the end of that page, he turned it over, and he began to write his complaint complaints about his wife. Finally he finished and then they exchanged their complaints of what they had written about each other. And the wife was a little embarrassed because as she began to read what her husband had written every line there was I love you. I don't always understand but I love you. I don't always agree with you but I love you. I hate when we fight, but I love you. Because love covers a multitude of sins. That's beautiful, thank you. Love is the bond of unity. And so the scripture says God has called us to peace. And I thank God for peace. Let the peace of God rule. Let it rule in your hearts. Rule functions as an umpire. The umpire makes the call and the decision is made because the umpire has made the call. He says, let it rule. We have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Let it rule. And how can 
the peace of God rule by letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Wisdom says, be thankful. Verse 15 says, give thanks. We are to be thankful and we are to give thanks. One lady says, I thank you, Lord, for my little husband. He ain't much of a husband, but he's all the husband that you gave me. <laughs> so in everything, we are to give thanks. <laughs> Everything's not going to be perfect, brother. But we are to give thanks. So not only does he talk about character in this passage, but he talks about our conduct, especially our conduct in our home. Sometimes the home life and the church life can be different for some, but the conduct in our home should be consistent in our church, in our workplace, and in our home. It should be consistent. Here's a verse that got me in trouble in my early years uh, of marriage. Um, it says, wives, submit yourself <laughs> to your husband oh boy. as is fit. And I would play with that word submit. And so one day I came home and I saw some bags were packed. And uh, we weren't scheduled to go on vacation. <laughs> Some of you are going to get it after a while. <laughs> um, my wife said, I'm tired and I'm going. I said, where are you going? She said, I don't know, but I'm going somewhere away from you. Uh, thankfully, it never got to that point because I had to retrain my mind. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I had to learn more about this word submit. More importantly, I had to learn more about the word Love, amen, and loving my wife. Yes. Yeah. Thankfully, uh, we're going on 29 years. And amen. 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 Submit has been misinterpreted, misused, and misapplied, and it's caused negative reactions because many of us, brothers, yeah. we misused, misunderstood, misrepresented what God meant. Yes, submit is a military term, but it means to voluntarily arrange oneself under authority of another. But we can get a greater appreciation from this word if we go to 1 Corinthians 11 and 3. And it says, I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Submit does not mean inferior. It means stand in a godly order. Christ willingly submitted himself to the Father. And the Father always has the best interest for his son. Man is expected to submit himself to Christ because Christ always has the best interest for man. <clears throat> And when a man is under the authority of Christ, he always has the best interest for his wife. And he wants to see her blossom and succeed. And he will do everything to help her to blossom and to succeed. Mm -hmm. The wife doesn't see it as bondage when the man is following the authority of God. And they are following God's plan. She is not obligated to follow her husband when it conflicts with spiritual, the spiritual command of God. That's why he says, submit as is fitting to the Lord. And when godly men lead the church, they have the best interest of the church. We need to be under the authority of Christ. And then the family, the church, can fall in place. Because there's another part of that. Verse 19 says, husband, love your wives and do not be bitter towards her. Then if we're going to please, we're going to leave a positive legacy for the next generation, we are called to demonstrate a love and respect for womanhood. 
We live in a day when time, when songs and videos glorify abuse and neglect mm -hmm. and uh, the danger of uh, how we communicate with the opposite sex and we forget that that's somebody's daughter, mm -hmm. that's somebody's sister, that's, right. that's somebody's mother. Mm -hmm. And when I'm talking to our younger men and younger guys, I, I often ask, uh, how would you feel uh, if someone spoke to your sister in a negative way, or your niece, or even your mother. And I think we have to put ourselves in those uh, shoes at times. Husband, he says, is, is commanded in Ephesians 5.25 to love his wife just as Christ loved the church. What did Christ do for the church? Died for the church, went to the cross for the church. That's a lot of love. And I don't know if, I'm going to say most of us have reached that, right? Yeah. But we should be thriving every day. He is to honor and to be considerate of our feelings. First Peter 3 and 7, husbands dwell with your wife with understanding, giving honors to her as the weaker vessel that your prayers may not be hindered. How many want their prayers to go toward heaven, to reach God? And he says it's a direct correlation of how we treat our wives. Paul leaves no stones un, un, uh, unturned because he goes down in verse 20 and 21. He says, children, obey your parents in all things, because this is well pleasing. Christ's perfect example was at baptism when uh, his father says, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Children should always honor mother and father. Where does it say in the Bible that we should stop honoring our parents? We keep honoring our parents. He tells the father, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Let's leave a legacy by building up and not tearing down. How do you want to be remembered when you're long gone? What do you want to be passed down? The story is told about uh, a nine-year-old who's pitching in a little league game and the boy could not make a good pitch. Every time he pitched, it was a ball. He was walking uh, batter after batter, player after player. And finally, the coach pulled him to the side and he tore into him. He's like, you can't hit the side of a barn. You're worthless. I don't even know why I have you pitching. They said, if someone in the stand says that if that was my son, uh, I would be all over that coach. And someone said, that is the coach's son. Mm -hmm. Fathers, do not provoke your children mm -hmm. lest they become dis discouraged. We can't live our lives through our children. God has called us all to be individuals. And he has given us a great work to do as individuals, especially as men and men of faith should be our desire to bring up our children as the scripture says in admonition of the Lord <clears throat> but we are to live our lives according to God train them up in the way they should go that they may not uh, that, that, that we may leave a positive legacy let's be the Joshua's of today as for me and my house we will serve the Lord Amen. God bless you, brother. Amen. Amen. Thank you for our time of sharing together. Appreciate it. <clears throat>